Okay, thanks everyone for coming to uh, another one of the One Pass thematic sessions on water waves. Uh, today we're pleased to have with us uh, Susanna uh, Hasiot from uh, the University of Vienna. And as you can see, she'll be telling us about uh, steady rotational water waves. Susanna? Hi. Um, so, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for organizing um, this online seminar and also for inviting me to give a talk. So, I will be talking about rotational water waves. Before I begin, um, I will set up the two-dimensional water wave problem. It's been done before, but I will recall it. So here we have our fluid domain, our water, which is separated from the air with, um, by a free surface. So this is a graphical function, y equal to eta of t and x. And this function eta is an unknown that we're going to have to find as part of any solution. And on the bottom, um, our domain is bounded by a flat bed which is impermeable, and we're going to denote it by y equal to minus d. Okay, so the velocity field in the fluid, we're going to denote it by u and v, where u and v are functions of t, x, and y. Now, in this talk, I'm only going to talk about steady traveling waves. So what this means is we're going to consider waves which, meet, um, which move at a constant speed, c greater than zero, and we're going to look at them in a frame which is moving at the same speed c as the wave. So in this moving frame, the wave is going to look like it's stationary, which is why we call it steady. And as a result, u and v are only going to depend on the x and the t variables through the combination of x minus ct. And from now on, I'm just going to refer to that as x. So the velocity field in this moving frame is now going to be u minus c and v. And what this tells us is the velocity of the fluid in this frame, which is moving at the same speed as the wave. Um, the density function, I'm going to denote this by rho. And density in a fluid is going to depend on salinity, temperature, or depth. OK. Um, so Euler's equations, the first assumption we're going to make is that the fluid is incompressible. So this is a very reasonable choice for water. We have conservation of mass. So notice here the density function rho is being transported. So it's going to be constant along particle trajectories. Uh, we also have conservation of momentum. So P here denotes the pressure inside the fluid and G is the gravitational constant. We also have boundary conditions. We have the kinematic boundary condition on the free surface, y equals to eta. Um, and this boundary condition relates the free surface to the rest of the fluid domain. And what it tells us is that any particle on this free surface is going to remain there as the flow develops. And we also are going to assume that v is equal to 0 on the bottom because we don't want the fluid to cross the floor of the domain. Uh, we have no assumptions on u, so we're, allowed it, um, we're allowing the fluid to slip along the lower boundary. Uh, we have the dynamic boundary condition. So what this tells us is the balance between the pressure above the free first surface and below it. So the free surface, y equals to eta of x. And if we neglect surface tension, um, we can just say that the pressure on this free surface is equal to the constant atmospheric pressure. And what this constant atmospheric pressure on the free surface does is it separates the motion in the fluid from the motion in the air. So here's a picture. Um, here we have our fluid domain, which is um, separated from the air with this free surface, y equals to eta of x. We have our dynamic boundary condition right here on this um, free surface. We have the kinematic boundary condition, so any particle on here is going to stay there. We have v equals to zero on the bottom, so we don't want any fluids to cross here. Um, incompressibility, conservation of mass, and conservation of momentum. Now, we're going to assume that density in the fluid is constant, and we can normalize it to be equal to 1. So from this incompressibility condition, we can introduce a stream function, which of course still is going to be relative to this moving frame reference that we're in. And we're going to choose it so that the gradient of psi is perpendicular to the velocity field. So what this means is that the integral curves of the velocity field 
which we refer to as streamlines, are going to be level sets of the stream function psi. So now from the kinematic band recognition, we can see that um, y equals eta of x, so the free surface, and the bottom y equals minus e are level sets of psi. So we can normalize um, psi on the free surface so that it vanishes, and then we can calculate the value of psi on the bottom since it vanishes right here. And what we get is that it's equal to minus p naught, where p naught is equal to the mass flux, again, relative to this moving frame that we're in. So what the mass flux tells us is the amount of fluid which crosses a vertical line which extends from the bottom to the free surface. And using the kinematic boundary condition, we can check that p naught is independent of x by just taking the x derivative right here. So now notice that the curl of the velocity field is equal to the Laplacian of the stream function. And if we eliminate the pressure term in Euler's equation, as was done in the previous talks, by just taking the y derivative of the first equation and the x derivative of the second one and subtracting, the pressure term is going to vanish. And we're left with this, which tells us that um, the Laplacian of psi and psi have the same level sets. So we can write the Laplacian of psi as a function of psi. And if we set the assumption that u, so this is the horizontal component of the velocity field is strictly less than c, so the speed of the wave, which in terms of the stream function formulation is going to tell us that the y derivative of the stream function is strictly positive, then this function gamma right here is going to be a single value function. Now gamma, um, gamma psi here is what we call the vorticity function. So what the vorticity function tells us is the local spin or rotation of a fluid element. So it's not gonna tell us anything about the global um, spinning or rotation movement of the fluid. And this is what makes these water waves rotational. If we were in the irrotational case, um, we would just have zero right here. Now, um, notice here, we eliminated the pressure term to get the vorticity distribution we regain it with Bernoulli's law. So Bernoulli's law says that the energy in the fluid is constant throughout the flow. So this is easy to check, taking the x and the y derivative respectively of e. So here we have the kinetic energy. Here we have the potential energy due to gravity. Here we have the energy due to pressure. And here we have this um, capital gamma term right here. So this is just notation and it's equal to the integral of the vorticity function. So this is just to ensure that we have a perfect derivative up here. Now, if we evaluate this energy at the free surface, y equals to eta of x, and we express u and v in terms of the stream function, we get this right here where q gathers the constant term. So we have the energy. Remember that the pressure on the free surface is equal to the atmospheric pressure and this term right here just comes from here. So this Q right here is called the hydraulic head, sometimes also referred to as Bernoulli's constant, and it's very often used as a bifurcation parameter for global bifurcation. So here now we have our new dynamic boundary condition. And here's the full problem for rotational steady water waves. So inside our domain, which is bounded below by an impermeable flat bed and above by an unknown free surface, we have the Laplacian of psi is equal to the vorticity. We have the kinematic boundary condition and we have the dynamic boundary condition due to Bernoulli. Now, if we knew our domain, the first three equations would tell us what psi is. However, we don't know what our domain is because we don't know what this eta of x is. So we have this last condition right here, this nonlinear um, dynamic condition, boundary condition, um, which tells us what the domain is if we know what psi is. So because of this free boundary nature of the problem, we have this force equation right here. For the rest of my talk, I'm going to be talking about periodic water waves. So what this means is these are water waves which are periodic of period L in the horizontal direction, which in our case is X variable, which means that the stream function psi or um, U, V, eta, they're all going to be L periodic in the X variable. 
So here's a picture. We have periodicity. So from one crest to another, we have a period which we can scale to be equal to two pi. Um, we have the free surface right here. So we only have to look at one period because what happens in the next is going to be the same thing. Now we have the free surface right here with the dynamic boundary condition due to Bernoulli and the kinematic boundary condition. And we have psi equal to minus P naught, which is the relative mass flux on the bottom. Now, one of the main difficulties of the water wave problem is the fact that this boundary right here is an unknown. We don't know eta of x. So the first thing we need to do is we need to find a suitable change of variable which would fix this domain. Um, one very elegant transformation, um, very widely used, is due to Dubois Jacodin. So she devised this in 1934 as part of her thesis. And with it, she constructed small amplitude waves with vorticity. Um, it wasn't until 2004 that um, large amplitude periodic rotational water waves were constructed using this transformation. And this was due to Konstantin and Strauss. And I will be talking a lot more about this result. Um, I just want to mention that since then, this transformation has been used to um, provide a lot of very important existence results, such as small and large amplitude solitary waves, stratified waves, stratified solitary waves. And it's also been used in many, many more instances. This is a very important transformation. So how does it work? Um, we have our fluid domain right here. So this is periodic, period two pi, and we're only looking at one period. Here we have our unknown free surface. And we're going to denote this domain by d of eta because it's going to depend on this free surface. Now we want to transform this into a known domain, which we'll call R, and it's a rectangle. And we do this by introducing the new coordinates, Q and P, where Q is equal to X, so we still go from minus pi to pi, and we set P equal to the stream function. So each P is going to be a level set of psi, and remember that the level sets of, of psi are streamlines, and that the top and the bottom um, of these yeah, are level sets of psi, and in fact, we know that on the top, psi is equal to zero. So we have p equal to zero right here. And remember on the bottom, we had psi equal to minus p naught. So with this transformation, we're just gonna have p equal to p naught. So this minus sign right here is just to ensure that the top of this boundary is going to be mapped to the top of the rectangle and the bottom is going to be mapped to the bottom. Now, one very important assumption we need in order to use this transformation is the fact that u, so the horizontal component of velocity, is strictly less than c. Um, because in terms of the stream function, this means that the y derivative of psi is non-negative, and notice we need this to be able to get from one domain to another. So here's the important assumption, and this is our change of um, coordinates. So q is equal to x and p to minus psi. And now we introduce the height function. So this is a function h of q and p. And what this function tells us is the height above the flat bottom on a given streamline for a given value x equals to q. And with this transformation, we are then able to transform our unknown fluid domain into a known rectangular domain. Now, the next thing we want to do is we want to take the problem in this um, fluid domain, the one I showed earlier, and we want to express it in terms of the height equation in this domain right here. And what we get is this quasi-linear elliptic problem. It looks slightly less welcoming than the problem we had in the fluid domain, but it has the advantage that we know what the domain looks like and this is something we can work with. So notice we have a nonlinear boundary condition here. This is due to Bernoulli. So of course, h is still going to be 2 pi periodic in the horizontal variable, which is now q. And the assumption of u strictly less than c, so the y derivative of the stream function being strictly positive, is going to be turned into um, 
the p derivative of the height function being strictly greater than zero throughout the rectangle. Now, um, we want to find small and large amplitude solutions to this problem. And I'm going to go through what was done in the paper of um, Konstantin and Strauss in 2014. So we want to begin with small amplitude theory. So the goal is now to prove the existence of a local curve of solutions. And we want to do this using local bifurcation theory of Krandal and Rabinovitz. So um, what this means is we start with trivial flows. Trivial flows are the simplest types of solutions. They're also called laminar flows or shear flows. And they're still periodic flows, but they have a flat interface and they are independent of the horizontal variable Q. And from these trivial flows, we want to um, find a local curve of solution which bifurcates from there. So this is, in some sense, we're um, perturbing locally the flat surface, which is why we refer to these as small amplitude solutions. Now, we can calculate these explicitly, and they are parameterized by the parameter lambda, and this is what they look like. Now, um, we want to use the theory of Krandel and Rubinovitz, so we need to put our problem into a functional analytic setting. So we have to define Banach spaces. These are going to be Hölder spaces of class C2 alpha. Um, so the x is going to be. And we are going to separate the height equation from the trivial solutions and express the whole problem in terms of w. So the advantage of doing that is that when we work with the trivial solutions, w is just going to be equal to zero. So this is better notation. Um, next, we reformulate the problem as a nonlinear operator equation, f, where f is given by f1 and f2, f1 being um, the operator inside the domain and F2, this nonlinear boundary operator. Now, um, in order to use the theorem of Krandel and Rubinovitz, the first thing we need to do is identify potential bifurcation points. And any um, lambda is a potential bifurcation point if the implicit function theorem fails at that point. If it doesn't fail, we just recover the true solution and nothing happens. Um, but that's not enough. Additionally, what we need is for the linearized operator about the trivial solutions. So here, W is zero because we're at the trivial solutions. At the bifurcate or the potential bifurcation point, lambda naught, needs to be a Fredholm operator of index zero with a one-dimensional kernel. And we also need a transversality condition to be satisfied. So um, the, we have this linearized operator right here appreciate derivative with respect to lambda of this operator evaluated at the element from this one dimensional kernel can't be in the range of this linearized operator. Now, if these two conditions are satisfied, then lambda naught is a bifurcation point and there exists a C1 curve of solutions and it's local solutions. So we call it C lock and we refer to them as small amplitude solutions. So here's a picture. Let's imagine that the straight line right here is our one parameter family of trivial solutions. And here's our bifurcation point lambda naught. And in the neighborhood of this bifurcation point, using the theorem of Krandel and Rabinovitz, we can find a local curve of solutions. So now what we want to do is we want to extend this local curve to a global curve and we find what are referred to as large amplitude solutions. And Konstantin and Strauss did this using a degree theoretical argument in the spirit of Rabinovitz. And um, I'm gonna talk much more about global bifurcation later on, but basically there's um, certain compactness assumptions which need to be satisfied. And if they're satisfied, we can extend this local curve. So this is a um, simplified sketch. We can extend this local curve to a global curve and we have alternatives. So either this global curve goes off to infinity or hits some open subset of the domain that we're working in, or it loops back to the bifurcation point. So Konstantin and Stas were able to eliminate this looping alternative using um, what is referred to as nodal analysis. So what this is, is 
um, checking that a set of monotonicity properties are satisfied by the solutions along um, on the curve. And this is done by using some very delicate maximum principle arguments. So this is not a trivial proof. And they were also able to um, simplify this unboundedness alternative right here um, to the statement that the solution approaches a flow where we have a point at which u is equal to c. So I'll, I'll mention this again. Um, so here's the main theorem. So we fix a wave speed, c greater than zero, a period two pi, the relative mass flux, a Hölder constant, a vorticity function. So there's a small constraint on this vorticity function. I didn't go into it. Um, so what we have is we have the existence of a global curve of solutions with the properties that um, the waves we have are two pi periodic, they are symmetric, they are strictly monotone, which means that between each crest and trough, um, the wave profile is strictly decreasing and strictly increasing between the trough and the crest. Um, the flow beneath each wave has no stagnation point. So a stagnation point is a point. So remember, we are in a um, frame which is moving at the same speed as the wave. So a stagnation point is a point in this, um, if we look at it through this frame, that appears to not move, so it's stagnant. So naturally, at that point, we must have u is equal to c. But remember, we had this assumption that you have to be strictly less than c in order to use this. Um, Dubois-Jacques with that transformation, so we have no stagnation points in our flow. And now the final conclusion is that there exists a wave where the maximum of u, so the maximum of the horizontal component of the velocity field, gets arbitrarily close to the wave speed c. Now, if we were in the irrotational case, so if the vorticity function were zero, this would necessarily happen. So the maximum of u would necessarily happen at the crest of the wave. Now there's numerical evidence, for example, in the paper of Cole and Strauss, which suggests that this doesn't, for rotational waves, it doesn't necessarily happen at the crest. And in fact, if we consider overhanging waves, um, so these are overhanging waves, the wave profile is no longer the graph of a function, we necessarily have u is equal to c anywhere where the wave profile is horizontal, vertical, sorry, vertical. Um, so unfortunately, this Dubray-Jacotin transformation doesn't allow for the construction of our hanging waves. So we need a new approach. And in fact, um, the, a rigorous existence proof of overhanging waves is still one of the biggest open problems in water waves. Um, but in a breakthrough paper in 2016, Konstantin Strauss and Vavaruka were able to prove the um, existence of large amplitude periodic waves with constant vorticity, which allows for the waves to have overhanging profiles. Um, very recently, I was able to extend this result to a certain class of stratified waves, and this is what I'm going to be talking about next. So um, because I'm going to be talking about stratified waves, I'm just going to very briefly describe what I'm going to be needing in order to set up my specific problem. Um, I believe there's a talk later on in the series which is going to talk more about this in detail. This is just the minimum of what I need. Um, so the first thing is the stream function we had earlier um, is no longer good enough. Stratified waves are waves in which the density function is no longer a constant. And the stream function we had doesn't take into account this stratification. So we need to introduce the pseudo stream function, which has the additional factor of rho. So this square root is just for algebraic purposes. Now, remember from the conservation of mass that the function rho, the density function, is transported, which means that it's going to be constant along streamlines. So we can express rho as a function of the pseudo stream function. Now, as we did for the constant density case, we can eliminate the pressure term from Euler's equation and we get this right here. 
Now notice if we were in the de constant density case, this term right here would just vanish and we would just be left with the same thing as we had earlier and we would get the vorticity distribution. Now what we see is that this term right here and psi have the same level sets. So we can write them as a function of each other and we call that beta. Um, I wanna point out that now we are omitting the assumption that u is strictly less than c or that the y derivative of the string function is non-zero. So this beta here is not necessarily a single value function. Um, and what beta describes is the variation of energy along streamlines. So again, if rho were constant, this would just be the vorticity function. Now, um, I'm going to set this beta of psi to be equal to some constant, and I'm going to call it gamma. So again, if we were in the homogeneous case, the constant density case, setting this would disappear. We would have the vorticity function, and setting it equal to constant, we would get constant vorticity. So setting beta equal to a constant is the mathematical analog of constant vorticity in the homogeneous case. And I'm also going to set some um, requirements on the density function. I'm going to ask that it's linearly dependent on psi. So we're going to set rho of psi is equal to a psi plus b. And of course, there's some discussion which can be made on the physical relevance of a and b. Now, um, because we want to construct waves which could potentially have overhanging profiles, um, we need to um, redefine the domain. We can no longer have, for instance, the free surface being a graphical function like eta of x was previously. Um, I would like to say right here that the notation I'm using in this talk is chosen so that it's consistent with the references that I'm using, just in case somebody wants to go and look up details so that it makes sense. So as a result, um, the first half of my talk and the second half of my talk have very different notations. And I will point out where these differences are just to avoid any confusion. So for example, the bottom right now is not gonna be at y equal minus d, we're gonna take it to be at y equals zero. Uh, we, we're going to parametrize the free surface by two functions, u and v. So again, very important, um, this little u and little v right here have nothing to do with the components of the velocity field that I mentioned in the first half of my talk. Um, these are completely different functions. So from now on, u and v are no longer the components of the velocity field. So of course, we still want this free surface to be periodic of period 2 pi over k, where k is the wave number. And we don't want this free surface to self-intersect. So we want some injectivity. And we're going to choose u and v to be um, Hilder functions in class C1 alpha. Now, uh, remember what the requirement I set on my density function was, a psi plus b. So we get the following problem in the physical plane. The Laplacian of psi is equal to gamma. So this is um, this beta of psi set to a constant. And a y, so this little a right here is just equal to capital A. This is the stratification term right here. This is just for notation. So again, um, if we had no stratification, this term would disappear. We have the kinematic boundary condition. Here, m is the pseudo mass flux. So again, it needs to take into account the effects of stratification. And this is what previously for the homogeneous case, I referred to as p naught. so this is the mass flux. And here's the Bernoulli boundary condition, the dynamic boundary condition, where b, again, um, is 2g, the gravity. And here we have, again, some stratification term included. And Q is still the hydraulic um, head from previously. So here's a um, picture. We have a free surface which may overhang, have overhanging profile. Um, we have the dynamic boundary condition on the surface, the kinematic boundary condition, and what happens inside. And we have a period of 2 pi over k. Now again, here we have this problem that the free surface is an unknown and we want to fix the domain. So what we want to do is we want to view the fluid domain as the conformal image of some strip. 
So how does this work? If we ignore the dynamic boundary condition for a minute, and we just look at the first three equations, by classical elliptic theory, we could, if we knew the domain, find a unique classical solution, psi, which satisfies this problem in some given function space. Now, what we want is we want to find a conformal map, u plus iv, from a given domain, a rectangular strip, into omega, which is suitably going to define the free surface so that this solution side of this problem right here also solves the dynamic boundary condition. So here's what this would look like. Here we have a strip and we want to find a conformal map which maps this strip into the fluid domain. Now, Konstantin Stas and Vavaruka were able to prove the existence of a unique constant h, which is called the conformal mean depth, such that there exists a strip of height h and a conformal map, u plus iv, which maps this strip of height h into our fluid domain, where u and v on the surface of the strip here satisfy the same um, conditions as the little u and the little v, which parameterize this free surface right here. So periodicity and objectivity. So what, we, what we're going to have is that the surface of the strip is going to map to the surface of the fluid domain and the bottom to the bottom. Now, since we have periodicity in the fluid domain, we're also going to have some periodicity in the strip. So we have a periodicity of 2 pi over k. Now, if we want to scale this and instead of working with a period of 2 pi over k, we want to work with a period of 2 pi, um, this rectangle right here isn't unique, it's, but the ratio between the length and the height is. So if we scale this by a factor of k, we also have to scale this by a factor of k. And so this is what we get. So we have this new domain, rkh, which is this rectangle right here from minus pi to pi and height kh, which we want to be the, the con we want a conformal map which maps this into our fluid domain. So this rectangle here is going to map into one period of the fluid domain. So um, this is what the problem looked like for stratified waves in the physical plane. Now what I want to do is I want to pull these terms right here into the Laplacian because um, harmonic functions are invariant via conformal mappings. So this is what this function will look like, and this function is now harmonic in the fluid domain. So now we can define a new function, zeta, inside this rectangle, which is just this function right here expressed in terms of the conformal coordinates u and v. So of course, this um, zeta is going to be harmonic in the rectangle, and we can express the kinematic boundary condition and the dynamic boundary condition in terms of the conformal coordinates as well, and this is what we get. Now, let's take a closer look at the conformal map u plus iv. So this is what, what we're looking for, and notice we only need to find one of these two functions because they're harmonic conjugates of each other, so if we have one, we can find the other. So let's look at v. In our rectangle, so the V is going to be harmonic. It's going to be zero on the bottom because we mapped the bottom to the bottom. And we're going to call on the top, on Y equals zero of the rectangle, we're going to call it little v of X. So here's what this problem looks like. And we have that um, the average of little v of x on the surface, Y equals zero, is going to be equal to this constant H. So this was this conformal mean depth. So throughout the rest of my talk, every time there's square brackets, this is going to represent the mean over one period of a two pi periodic function. Now, if we use the definition of the Dirichlet Neumann operator, so, or sometimes also referred to as Dirichlet two Neumann operator because it maps Dirichlet data to um, Neumann data, we can express the y derivative of this function v on the surface y equals zero as the Dirichlet Neumann operator acting on little v of x. Now, because 
U is the harmonic conjugate of minus V in the rectangle. We can use the definition of the Hilbert transform to express U on the surface of the rectangle Y equals zero in terms of the periodic Hilbert um, transform acting on little v of x. Now using the Cauchy-Riemann equations, we can remember this here was given by the Dirichlet Neumann operator. We can express the y derivative of v on the surface y equals x in terms of the Hilbert transform of acting on v prime, so this is little v of x. Similarly, if we look at the problem satisfied by the function zeta, if we ignore the dynamic boundary condition for now, we again can apply the Dirichlet Neumann operator and the periodic Hilbert transform to find an expression on the surface y equals zero for the y derivative of zeta. And notice now that the y derivative of zeta is expressed entirely in terms of this function little v of x. And now, because we know we can reformulate this term right here and any term involving a y derivative, we can reformulate this whole dynamic boundary condition as such entirely in terms of this little v of x. So basically what we did is we had a two-dimensional elliptic system and we were able to reduce it to a one-dimensional pseudo-differential equation um, of this function little v of x. So we still, and of course, we still have this constant h here to deal with as well. So little v of x is going to be two pi periodic, and we also want it to be strictly positive. We don't want the fluid to cross the bottom of the domain, um, and we want the free surface to be non-self intersecting. So just as a reminder, what's the connection between little v of x and our free surface? Um, there is here we have little v of x and little u, which parameterize this free surface. So really all we have to do now is find this little v of x. And we wanna do this using bifurcation theory. We wanna find solutions to this problem. Now, if we wanted to use, um, for local bifurcation theory, this expression right here would be enough. However, for global bifurcation, and there's some compactness assumptions which need to be satisfied and doesn't seem to be the case right here, so we need to reformulate it. Now, um, if anybody was here last week for Professor Tolan's talk, he presented the Babenko equation for irrotational water waves. So we are going to reformulate this expression right here as a Babenko type formulation. So this is what it looks like. Kappa here is um, scalar terms, there's a lot of them. If I were to write them out, it would probably take up two more slides. And a lot of them are due to the stratification, um, which is coupled with a scalar constraint. So remember, square brackets are just the average over um, a period, two pi. So this is just all just scalar terms. Now, why is this a Babenko type formulation? If we set all the little a's equal to zero, we get rid of stratification entirely and we're only left with the case of constant vorticity. And now if we also set this vorticity equal to zero, so we set everything that has a gamma or an A equal to zero, we get this, um, this Babenko equation that Professor Tolan presented last week for irrotational water waves. So of course this here looks considerably less elegant than what he presented last week but this is what we're gonna work with. And I just wanna point out, this is not just um, an algebraic reformulation of the problem. So this does involve some um, ideas from Riemann-Hilbert theory. Now, um, existence theory. So we want to um, show the existence of solutions. So M and Q are parameters and V, we want it to be um, in the Hilbert space, two alpha and two pi periodic, and we want it to be even. So we want the waves to be symmetric. And again, we're gonna start with the theory of Krandal and Rabinovitz. So um, as I explained previously, we wanna start with a family of trivial solutions. Again, laminar flows. These are solutions which are independent of X. So in our case, they're really just going to be equal to H. Now, if we plug V equal to H into this expression right here and into the scalar constraint that we have right here, we're gonna find that Q is equal to this. So we find a relationship between the parameter Q and the parameter M. 
So this is the case for trivial solutions. It's not necessarily the case for non-trivial solutions. So we are going to introduce a new parameter, mu, which takes the difference of the two. So for trivial solutions, this mu is just going to be equal to zero. And this term inside here, we're going to denote it by lambda. And in physical coordinates, this would give us um, the horizontal velocity of the trivial solutions. So this is, um, this is a decent um, bifurcation parameter for local bifurcation because it's related to speed velocity. So again, we have to express our problem in a functional analytic setting. Um, as we did previously, we're going to separate v from the trivial solutions and express the whole problem instead um, in terms of w with the advantage that when we look at what happens to trivial solutions, this w is equal to zero. Um, we rewrite the problem as a operator equation with the Banach spaces x and y, where f is equal to f1 and f2. f1 um, encompasses this um, Babenko type formulation and f2, the scalar constraint, we don't have to worry too much about f2. Now, using um, the theory of Crandall and Rabinovitz, as I expressed in the first half of the talk, if we imagine that this straight line right here is our trivial solution, then we find a whole sequence of bifurcation points. And in the neighborhood of each one of these bifurcation points, we can find a local curve of solution. And now again, we want to extend each of these local curves of solution to global one. And we're going to do this using the real analytic global bifurcation theorem, which is due to Dancer and which was later improved by um, Buffoni and Toland. So there's a few assumptions which need to be satisfied. Um, first of all, we need X and Y to be Banach spaces. And then we need to define an open subset in our domain. And we need F to be real analytic on this open subset. And then we have some compactness conditions which need to be satisfied. So the first thing is the linearized operator, so linearized with respect to W, has to be Fredholm of index zero. And we also need that the intersection of the set of solutions with all the elements of a family of bounded closed subsets of O, where the union of all these subsets gives us O, has to be compact. So in some sense, we need compactness of solutions. So very briefly, um, just the main idea of the proof, we define some open subset and rewrite F1 in the following way. So here, these are just the scalar terms and this JW right here is a whole sum of commutators of this form, F times the Hilbert transform of G minus the Hilbert transform of F times G. Now, there's this theorem for commutators, which tells us, I find this theorem quite remarkable, that if F is in CJ alpha and G is in CJ minus one alpha, then the commutator is in CJ delta where delta is a little less than alpha. So we don't lose any regularity in the J, we only lose a little bit in the alpha. So as a result, this commutator is gonna map bounded, um, bounded sets in C2 alpha into bounded sets of C2 delta. And so these are gonna be relatively compact subsets of our um, space Y, of our Banach space Y. And so if we divide everything in F1 by this term right here, so this justifies the choice of our open set, we can express this W right here as a compact nonlinear operator and then compactness um, follows. So what we get is, so this of course, we, um, this applies to every single one of these bifurcation points. I only drew it out for one of them we can now extend this local curve of solution to a global curve and we get different alternatives. So either this curve goes off to infinity, in which case the regularity of the proof surface would blow up, or it's going to hit the boundary of this domain O. And from the definition of O, um, so it's not easy to see because this is in parameter form, but what would happen if we hit the domain would be that we would get a wave of greatest height with a stagnation point at the crest. And then we have 
this alternative, again, this loop alternative that the curve loops back and hits again the trivial solutions. And again, um, this can be ruled out by nodal analysis, so by checking that monotonicity properties are satisfied by the solution along the curve using maximum principle arguments. Now, the last thing I want to say is that the solutions along this curve are not necessarily water waves. So for any solution on the curve to be a water wave, it needs to be, um, we need to have the free surface be in the upper half plane. We don't want the free surface to cross the bottom. And also we don't want it to be self-intersecting. Now, because of these monotonicity properties we have, and because of our symmetry assumption, there's only two places where this free surface can self-intersect. And this is either along the crest line, because if the wave profile hits the crest line, because of symmetry, we're gonna have a point of self-intersection right here. And similarly, um, the trough line would also be a potential place, because if the wave profile hits the trough line because of symmetry, we're going to have um, a point of self-intersecting right here. So we're able to rule out this alternative right here, and we're just left with this. So this is the theorem. And basically what we have is a, a family of global curves, because remember we had a whole family of bifurcation points, and each of these could be extended to a global curve. And we have two alternatives. So either the entire curve is a curve of solutions to the water wave problem, in which case either um, the curve goes off to infinity or we reach a wave of greatest height with a stagnation point at the crest. And the other alternative is that this um, curve of solution exists until the limiting point at which um, the wave profile self intersects, and this has to happen strictly um, to, above the trough line. Yeah. So um, this is what I wanted to present. Of course, there is a lot more that can be said on rotational water waves. Um, I didn't talk about solitary waves. There's other ways to transform the domain. There is the flattening technique, which consists of flattening the free surface. Um, but this is all that I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susanna. Um, okay, so as per usual, what we're going to do is um, uh, mute everyone, and in doing so, that will give you the right to unmute yourselves. Um, uh, Susanna, remember that includes you. You'll have to re uh, unmute in a second, and uh, then I'll, we'll, we'll take questions. So just a second, I'm going to give everybody the right to unmute. Okay, you should now have the right to do so. Uh, if you have, are, are there any uh, comments or questions? Yeah, Susanna, um, you're probably anticipating this question. <laughs> um, the what's the role? <coughs> Could you talk a little more about your main assumption on the density that it's a linear function of psi? and right. what that means. <coughs> okay, um, so this was... Um, so, um, yeah, there. We choose, yeah, we choose the density function to be a linear function of psi. This is purely from a mathematical standpoint, mm -hmm. um, because the idea is to pull this term right here into the Laplacian. Mm -hmm. And this can only happen, so here we have the derivative of the density function. This is why we have this little a right here. And otherwise we would have a psi right here and this would complicate matters significantly. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um. So I, I was going to ask an extension on that. So rather than jump back to the audience, I'm going to take over. Uh, um, so can you, can you, uh, in this technique, can you understand how the solutions change with respect to these parameters, uh, with respect to, I guess, capital, the, the linearity parameters with respect to capital A and B, which get morphed into other things along the way? Uh, um, so, yeah, so this capital A, is basically this little a that you see right here. It's just 
factor of the gravity added to it. So this, um, everywhere where you see this little a, oh, where's the problem? So for instance, right here, the, every time you see a little a, this is going to be the influence of stratification. So the remarkable thing is that this, um, this problem was done by Konstantin Staus and Rebrucka for constant vorticity. And what I did is I added some stratification and we basically get the same results. Okay, I, but uh, what I mean is more like, um, can, do you know, for instance, through implicit function theorem or something like this, that as you change the value of A, the solutions, let's say, change in a smooth way or, or, or uh, is, is that sort of a, a byproduct of this technique or is A just a sort of fixed parameter then you don't study it as it changes? Uh, I don't, it doesn't appear at all. I don't study it at all, so. Okay. At least as far as I know, I don't think the choice of A makes any significant difference on the analysis. Okay. If A is zero, it's like the case we did before, yes. but, if, but then the other way would be, suppose you let A get very large, that might have some, that must have some physical meaning. Right, yeah, I didn't look very if much. If A is very large, the density is very big somewhere, you have to tell me. Right. Uh, but also, if depending on the sign of A, isn't mm -hmm. your the water heavier or the density higher at the top or at the bottom? Right. And yeah. you say that- So traditionally, that's what we have. We have the we want the density to be greater on the bottom than on the top. But the, the more delicate matter here is that we are allowing for the constructions of waves that can have overhanging profiles. And when a wave overturns, we're necessarily going to have that this um, density is going to be flipped. So that's why there's no constraint set on A because it would flip anyway. And in your case, you find solutions in both cases, yes. A positive and A negative, so somehow. Okay, so uh, any other questions or comments? Yeah, so this is something that I probably didn't understand. So at the end, you rule out one of the two alternatives when the, when the waves touch. So what makes that different from the other one? Like what, what makes it like that you can rule it out whereas you cannot rule the other one? Um, this is just... Um, yeah, that, uh, right here, this one, yeah. So yeah. this alternative here, um, this alternative here is we can rule this out and then the only alternative that we're left with is this one. And if this one would not be ruled out, then we would have a contract. So this is a mathematical argument, basically. We're able to rule um, this one out using maximum principal arguments. Okay. okay. So it's not so much about the intersection itself, it's probably about like the, like the, the bubble being fluid or, or air, right? In some sense. Meaning because that's sort of the difference between one picture and the other. Right. Yeah, I, I haven't thought about that. Uh, and just can you, uh, I didn't get what the relevance of the little k was. So. Um, k is the, is the wave, is the wave number. So if we, Go back to where I set up the problem. So this is the period. The period L is defined to be 2 pi over k. And the only reason why we have a k right here is because we're, we want to work in a setting of 2 pi rather than 2 pi over k. This is just for nicer notation, I guess. Okay, it's, it's the period. More questions or comments? Anybody else? Well, if a row were more complicated, not linear function, like quadratic, whatever, I mean, then you'd have some equation for psi, which is more complicated. Right. 
And the argument which you didn't really, the proof which you didn't really show of the global stuff and the nodal properties and everything is very, very dependent upon, on, on a, it seems to be very dependent on your relatively either constant density or linear density. Yeah, so it depends very heavily on the fact that we're working with harmonic functions. So there's really a big open question to try to do the same kind of thing, you know, with, with a more, you know, physically more general kind of um, uh, density. I mean, that's, that's a, an important open problem, I think. We'd have to use different techniques, probably. Uh, okay, well, if you'll, uh, if you'll forgive me, I have one more since we have a little bit more time. Are there, uh, and, and maybe this also is slightly directed uh, at, at Walter since you just sort of brought this up. I, you know, when, when you write these rules down that say something like uh, the vorticity is a function of the streamline with, with the gamma or, or in this setup where the, the density is a function of the streamline, this sort of reminds me of, you know, the, the, the game of, of uh, choosing constitutive relations and continuum mechanics. And when you do this, then there are certain constraints on what things that you can actually use uh, due to things like, um, you know, um, uh, what, what, what am I trying to say? The second law of thermodynamics, things like that. So you, you, you have these like clausius home inequalities that sort of put constraints on the form. So I guess what I'm asking is, is there, is there anything like this uh, in, in this industry? Is there any constraint on the choice of either gamma or, or rho? in principle uh, as to like how the, the response behaves relative to the streamline? Any, any idea? I, okay, well, this is just- I a, don't know. <laughs> okay. Uh, w w Walter, do you have any idea? I, I, I'm not sure I quite got what you meant there when you say so, anything like what? Is there, okay, so for instance, you know, if, if you put, uh, when you're deriving Navier-Stokes, you know, you can do something like you can say, well, look, the, uh, the stress tensor is going to be a function of the velocity field. And then you play games with some very generic arguments and, and continuum mechanics, and you find out that it has to depend on the symmetrized gradient. And, and the game is coming from, translate, uh, from, from frame invariance. And then you do the coleman Null procedure to find out that it has to depend uh, in a way where certain coefficients behave in certain ways, blah, 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 blah. There, there's this whole continuum mechanics literature about sort of starting from the absolute most general case and then using frame invariance and things that are like the, the, the laws of thermodynamics to put very serious constraints on the constitutive relations. So I guess what I'm asking is, is there anything that you can say in that spirit as to what the choice of the function gamma or the function rho is like, is there any natural sort of physical constraint as to how gamma and rho can depend on, on the stream function? Uh, yeah, that, well, and I don't, I don't think like frame invariance or anything is, is relevant or anything like that isn't, but, but there are physical situations that you expect. So, so the vorticity, if you take, for instance, the ocean, then what happens is the vorticity is, Probably in typical situations, the vorticity is changing a lot right near this, might, might be changing a lot near the surface where you have wind and so on. And then down below, as you go deeper, it becomes much more quiet down there. And so, and so vorticity tends to be like, a, like a, a lot of, in such a situation, a big change, a lot of variation right near the surface and not much variation below. So it'd be like a curve that sort of has curvature here and then it goes pretty flat. Uh, you know, that kind of physical argument is, and, and then also similarly, I think with the density, you know, the density usually depends, in the ocean at least, depends on the most, most commonly on temperature and salinity. Those are the two things that really affect rho. And so that means it's, you know, usually colder, usually colder as you go deeper and so on. 
and, and so there are certain curves that are typical in the in the engineering literature you'd see a lot of a lot of graphs of typical such situations so it, i think it's directly from the physics and there's no i don't think there's any general like invariance principle or anything that restricts it but there aren't a lot of there are not a lot of free parameters here there's only the vorticity and the density. I think those are really the only, and a couple of constants, like the speed of the wave and so on. Uh, but, but it's a rather fixed problem uh, with, with only those, the, those two functions, the density and the, and the, and the, um, and the vorticity of things that can, can change. And, and I think they're motivated by the, by, experiments by observations of the ocean or other fluids. Okay, thanks. Uh, well, one more time. Anybody else? Okay, well, let's uh, thank Susanna again.